Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today. We are delighted to have with us Mr. Harsh Mariwala. Mr. Harsh Mariwala leads Marico Limited as its chairman. Over the last three decades, he has transformed a traditional commodity-driven business into a leading consumer products company in the beauty and wellness space. He was recently bestowed the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award 2020 for India, which is the world's most pre prestigious business award for entrepreneurs. Mr. Mariwala's recent book, Harsh Realities, The Making of Mariko, hit the stands on 30th July. This book encapsulates his journey, the challenges he has faced, the risks he took, and the learnings from not only his successes, but more importantly, his failures. I've gone through the book and I recommend everybody else in this audience also does so. I have personally seen Mariko transform from a family owned business to a very successful professionally run organization. And we hope that today we will gain some insights and learnings for all the entrepreneurs who are watching. Thanks Mr. Mariwala for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Bunita, my pleasure. Uh, my first question to you is at what stage in a family-owned business, should ownership be clearly separated, whether it is the <laughs> siblings or cousins, extended family, or even from parents? Uh, I think it's a tough question because normally there's a very close intertwining of ownership and management. And uh, I wish there was the right answer. A lot depends on the kind of business you are in. There are some businesses where the family's active involvement can be very crucial. And businesses like uh, something like a trading where you have to take uh, frequently, you have to take some calls in terms of investing or foreign exchange or whatever else where the family member has the authority uh, and also is equipped to take that risk. Uh, I think in those businesses, it is better that the family manages uh, and owns the company. It so happened that in India, most of uh, the time, uh, or all the time I've seen, it's the family and ownership is never segregated. It's always there. And in my case, my whole journey, I, I decided to step down as managing director. And uh, I'm now, I call myself as an active strategic investor, where I don't have a say in day to day running of the company. I get involved, but my time involvement is only 20% of uh, um, the time available. And there's a clear role definition between me and the managing director. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't get any phone calls to for my approval. We have laid down our way of working, which involves that I have to add value rather than control things. So I'm I'm on top of things, what are happening in the company by getting monthly reports and interacting with the management team months a month for a few hours. But beyond that, uh, my role is more at a, at a I would say at a uh, influencing stage where I have to influence others to improve performance by having conversations with leadership teams, everybody or conversations, then meeting relevant hires at very senior levels, uh, talking publicly. I don't do investor relation that gets done by the managing director. So I think I have been able to do that, but uh, I've seen that there are very few Indian organizations which uh, have really been able to segregate ownership from management. But you, you've actually done two transitions. One was separating out the family interests. When I was reading yeah. your book, um, I guess the company started with many branches of the family in, uh, you know, entangled in um, a host of different businesses together. Yeah. And you set up how to separate out the ownership. Yes. And only after maybe three decades or two decades, did yeah. you actually do the second transition, which yeah. was from a professional, uh, from yeah. a family run business to a yeah. professional run. Yeah. So, um, so from, from the learnings that you've had, I guess the first step you would recommend is that people separate out the extended family uh, ownerships into a cleaner um, sections, or is that not as relevant? Uh, what is more important, I guess, is it the professionally run Bit, yeah. or is it separating the family ownership interests? So I, I just want correction, Punita, in my own journey, first stage was actually not separating ownership. The first stage was actually separating management and giving accountability to each family members to manage a company at the top. Normally, 
what happens in most family managed companies is that many family members are involved in day to day running of the organization and that leads to a lot of confusion the role clarity is not there among the family members uh, it is difficult to attract talent when uh, good talent sees that so many mem- family members are are in management positions it could lead to dual reporting so i i established my business in my initial years uh, in bombay oil industries uh, which had my father and my uncles and i was the first person from the next generation to join the business and for 20 years i was part of that company but at some stage i realized that you know being a part of a larger family managed organization and by then four of my cousins had joined business was actually not helping me at all because i was not able to attract talent there was no clear uh, policy for allocation of capital between different profit centers and uh, there were conflicts in terms of uh, there were no synergies also in the businesses so i spent about 2 to 3 years advocating internally uh, within the family that uh, let's demerge bombay oil into four different businesses which was and then let each uh, family member a youngster uh, take it over as the ceo or managing director so that was my first set of transition and it was not ownership shift it was the ownership was similar so when marico was formed the ownership was same in four part that is my father and three of his brothers you know uh, but it so happened that over a period of four five years we had some differences of opinion which led to a split in ownership also wherein uh, i had to buy over two uh, two families interests and from 1994 95 onwards uh, just me and one of my uncles uh, have ownership uh, so i think that has been the the way it has worked out but the key thing is you know it's very important to deal with a lot of patients family issues can actually be very complex because you are just not uh, related to each other you are also competing within the organization in terms of roles you are playing so you are playing multiple roles as promoter manager and also different generation between me and my father or my uncle you know it's the openness is not there so there is a lot of complexity uh, gets added because of these complex role relationships and i was able to do that by having this split uh, of businesses under different companies accountable to family but uh, gave me a lot of freedom in terms of managing my business if i did well then i had the freedom to allocate money uh, to my business and it would not go to some other some other family part of the business so that was a big big liberating moment for me and uh, it took me 2 to 3 years but looking back it has been the most important decision for me if i had not done that properly i would have been fighting uh, family battles because you seen it in many families that once um, they start fighting it's sometimes never ending and the impact is maximum on the business and frustration with the family so my advice to those who are a part of a larger family arrangement is that you know you have to have a lot of patience uh, you have to build consensus and ideally speaking you should get hold of somebody who the family trusts an external person but the whole family has to trust and then arrive at what is the way forward now your second question is when should the ownership uh, within the family get divided again there is no right answer you know if things work out you can be joint owners but more important is clarity in terms of the roles and no overlap in terms of dual reporting and i mean it could be that three or four families are owners but as long as they uh, and each one can manage a different business and it can coexist a lot depend on the family itself you know and the kind of business you are in but i am of the opinion that uh, too many family members adds to complexity there have been cases where a few members have been able to coexist uh, and coexist well so to sum up there is no right answer but family issues are very very crucial and each family member or each uh, each of the person who is listening to this conversation have to take this seriously because it is not as easy as just uh, dividing responsibility there are a lot of egos involved and you know so it's it's very complex but you have to go in depth and try and resolve those issues right i mean i was actually surprised when i was reading a book that 70% of the world's businesses are family owned Yes. We often only see the, you know, the professionally run ones, especially as uh, investors in the listed yeah. space. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, why is it that very few family-owned businesses have made this transition successfully? What did you do that others have not been able to? I don't know why they have not been able to move, but uh, maybe they have not realized the need. You know, for me, it was very important to attract talent. You know, for the kind of business I am in, which is packaged goods or fast-moving consumer goods, uh, talent has played a very, very important role. Because I converted the whole business from unbranded to branded without any capital investment by just sheer distribution and marketing inputs and new product development. And whenever I've improved the quality of talent, it has paid me rich dividends. So I was very keen that I had to attract the best quality talent. And if I was not able to do that, I would not be able to grow. Because in this business, it is the quality of talent. And you've seen it in FMC, they employ the best quality managers and the most demanded managers. And our, we also pay them very, very well. So, and my target in terms of attracting talent about companies like Levers or Procter & Gamble or L'Oreal or, or any other Indian well-managed uh, FMCG company. So to make that happen, one had to take those calls and take those decisions in terms of giving me independence. And since that day, I have not treated this company as a family managed organization. I've given all the signals to the external market that this is a professional organization and only merits will play an important role. Only merits will work. Uh, if you have any, I mean, somebody else, you tell me to employ your friend or whatever, I will at the most ask my team to evaluate, but the ultimate decision is the team decision. And it's very important to have very high standards of governance in a family manager organization because good managers, they don't want to dirty their hands. They don't want to take shortcuts. And if you, and not only forget about good managers, but good associates, good employees these days, they are looking at ESG and you've seen so many boards that ESG has become the hot topic in all the boards. It started with governance, but after the pandemic, now it's expanded to ESG, which is a very good development. And I think organizations have to take into account all these issues because it's, it appeals to all the stakeholders and all the stakeholders are demanding this. And even consumers are looking at ESG journey in terms of what is the packaging or whatever else you're doing, which is adding something negative to the, envir to the environment. So I think you have, if you have to turn the company into a professional company, you have to have very high standards of ESG, meritocracy, and influence will not work, and then attract the best quality talent. Now in some sectors, especially say technology, where uh, you need um, the founder itself to be very involved in the company because they really clearly have the innovative mindset and they have the either the IP or the algorithm or you know the passion to build the company and we are seeing a lot of tech startups in India that start off by professionals who yeah. you know eventually they will become a family-owned business so um, in a sector like technology or say in pharmaceuticals where we see quite a bit of uh, family ownership um, yes. or the founder ownership rather yes um, how do you separate out um, the involvement of the founder who's so key to driving the company? So I think the key thing is to, for the founder to realize that this is not his own company, his or her own company. So it may be a publicly quoted company. The fact that it, many founders, unfortunately promoters think that because they are the promoters, because they have a majority shareholding, they are entitled to treat that company as their own company. It is not their company. I mean, you are the majority shareholder, but you have other external shareholders. So the organization's interests come first, you know. Whatever you're doing, whatever decisions you're making, the organization's interests come first, which means that you're accountable to the external board of directors. Uh, and the board of directors will take a call, you know, how good are you as a CEO? Or if you have any other family member who is in a, who is in a senior position, are they effective? And if they're not effective, then it is not in the interest of the company. So it's very important that an independent body like a uh, board of directors takes calls on that. And the starting point is the mindset of the promoters. Unfortunately, in India, people say that this is my company, you know, just because one is promoted. If it is a private company, I understand. But it is a publicly listed company. You are not the owner of the company, you know. You have only 50-60% shareholding, you know, which is not right for you to say that I will do whatever I feel like doing because it is my company. It is not your company. But even private uh, companies, you have external yeah. stakeholders, venture capitalists, uh, private Yes, so, yeah, sure. As long as the shareholding is diluted to others and not fully held by 
by the family it has other stakeholders you know so so uh, but if the founder is the one who's driving the vision and has the technology or the you know the expertise in that in that setup or that the company is operating in is it uh, is it necessary that you should still um, you know professionalize it and not have the founder as involved no not really i mean if the founder is able to add value all i'm saying is you segregate your ownership from uh, from management you have to treat yourself as a whatever as a managing director but don't make yourself the owner the problem comes in when the managing director who is a family member thinks that he is the owner and the ownership interests overtake the the organization's interest that's not sound so you have to segregate the two in, in your mind and you have to be independent you have to uh, you have to behave like a manager as if you are equally accountable to the board in whatever you're doing and if you're able to add, add value why not continue there's no harm in continuing but the mindset you have is has to have uh, has to be a mindset of okay i'm a part owner i am accountable to the board and my role is as managing director and not as owner yeah so you're right in india the normal tendency in the indian society is to be hierarchical and automatically is thought that the son will follow the father but is it good for the company it could be good for the company i'm not saying it is always bad for the company the son may have some other interests i mean is it worth pushing your children to do something which they are not fond of or the son may not be ready and you it's time for you to step down because you reached a certain age so you have to take interests which are good for the organization rather than what is good for you and again i'm going back to that thing that you know you have to treat yourself not like an owner because you're not the owner you are the board takes a call on all this and in this case also the board was instrumental in taking a call on this and of course at a social level it is difficult but uh, i think looking back it has been a good decision because it has resulted in substantial shareholder value creation and uh, it has also given me a lot of opportunity to do new things which i would never have been able to do so and number 3 it has given a very strong signal in the capital markets that this organization is uh, is uh, progressing in the right way and in future there won't be any succession planning issues and even if this person will be in there as a managing director for last 6 years and once this term expires then again the board will decide what is good and not me as a promoter and the, to that extent it is my duty to have a board which is independent board which is very capable which is also involved in in basically judging human interactions human management human management team so that managerial judgment is a very important part of board deliberations and the board also interacts a lot with managers and when it comes to succession planning either to promote somebody from internal or external and committees like nomination remuneration committee they are continuously go on evaluating what is the internal talent pool uh, how can we have a robust succession pipeline not only for the md but one level lower also small entrepreneurial family owned businesses who don't really have strong boards how do they accomplish this culture of innovation um, and all the things you mentioned so i think the key thing in culture building is to decide what values are critical for you to succeed or they will play an important role in driving your organization's journey and i think very clear for me innovation was the prime value which i was trying to build because innovation had played a very important role in my own journey uh, prior to being prior to starting marico so i built a culture which would turn us into an perpetual innovation engine and what drives innovation within an organization one is the quality of talent second is diversity of talent number 3 how empowering are people in terms of their own roles uh, number 4 is there a fear of failure number 5 is there experimentation uh, number 6 it is how what is the role of top management in terms of uh, treating failures what is the role of top management in terms of facilitating innovation are there innovation champions so we have built an organization which is a very flat structure which empowers people very good quality talent by recruiting management trainees every year from ease schools of management give them a lot of empowerment uh, to ensure so the flat structure ensures high degree of empowerment the role of top management is to go on asking for innovation experimentation remove the fear of failure 
uh, encourage prototyping, have innovation facilitators, have innovation awards internally within the organization. So innovation will flourish in an organization which has, which has these values. And depending on the kind of business one is, and you have to identify what values are very, very crucial, which will help the organization succeed. And then try and find out how do you reinforce these values on a perpetual basis. It could be safety. It could be, it could be service level, depending on the kind of business you are in. But then you have to think deep in terms of if these are your values, how do you ensure that, you know, you encourage those values and, you know, encourage people to exhibit those values. And the role of top, man top management is very, very crucial in culture building. Because the top two, three layers of management, they don't take this subject seriously. It will not filter down, down the line. So it's very important to, to basically to arrive at a consensus with the top management and go on enculturizing the talent which comes in from outside to a culture. And to me, a culture is a source of competitive advantage. If you, well, it is a lot of hard work. It cannot be done within a few months or one or two meetings. It is, it has taken me three to five years to build a culture and it's just normal. Uh, but, and the key challenge then is to how do you maintain that culture as you grow, as old people leave, you acquire some new facilities, you start new businesses, you enter new countries. So it's a continuous thing which the HR function has to uh, work on. I mean, uh, you um, split the role of Cheb and CEO in your own yeah. company and have put yes. together a very strong board. Yeah. Um, and how difficult was it for you? <clears throat> I was reading a book and it, it seemed it was quite difficult for you initially and your family when you decided to give up active day-to-day -day management. Um, uh, and move into a chair position. So yeah. um, how do you, why is it that um, even though our regulators have mandated the split from chair and CEO, I mean, uh, families are making, finding it so hard to do that? Because I think there is a reluctance in terms of what will happen to the company if I give up control. There is a belief that I'm the best person to manage the company. And I don't think, Anybody can say that I'm, I'm the best person. You know, there'll always be somebody else. You have to find that person who could occupy your shoes. Uh, because if even if you're the best person, you're not going to live forever. You will be operational for whatever number of years you're active. And the whole system has to be strong and not just you. So if the entrepreneur thinks that he knows it all, if the entrepreneur is not willing to delegate, if the entrepreneur is not willing to invest in other talent which can take over from him, then it will be very difficult to segregate the roles. But if the entrepreneur has a mindset that, okay, I have to delegate, I have to empower others, I have to make myself redundant and select talent which is better than me, then there's no issue at all. Right, right. So, I mean, I think um, uh, we have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in the audience today and some are larger than others. So I guess it depends on what stage of your um, company you're at. And you're right. So you I, I did that when I was 63. So it, you're right, absolutely right, you know. So I was active in the company as managing director for almost uh, for how many years, 20 years or so, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's not a recipe necessarily for success very early on. I guess you have to build the company and bring it to an equilibrium where yeah, I mean, if you if you are good at your job, then you can continue for a longer period. I'm not saying that you should immediately do it. But every five, ten years, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is my role and what it should be? And the role also goes on shifting because in my earlier days, I, when you're small, you're doing things on your own. A lot of things come to you on a daily basis for decision making. And then maybe you become larger than the whole shift happens to actually recruiting good talent and team building and processes and things like that. And when you're very large, you have to influencing others so i think you have to go on asking what is my current role which i can empower others to do though you may be the same managing director but as, as the business is expanded you have to go on relinquish some parts of your role because otherwise to what extent will you go on working all the time you know and uh, i think the organization also has to become far more stronger and separately to attract talent they need a new challenge you know they can't uh, i mean their business or their roles have to expand and that can come if you start re-looking at your own role 
and you know start delegating and not saying abdicating responsibility delegate which means you are accountable for delegation you have to delegate to somebody who's capable and that you should be confident that the person should be able to manage you know so ultimately you are accountable for the delegation also and you can't say that because i delegated i failed and then you know don't hold me accountable i mean we've talked about obviously the benefits of a separating out family ownership b uh, having professional managers and c having a strong board but what are you losing are you losing anything by separating out family ownership are you losing anything by professionalizing and you know stepping a little bit away from day to day management so a lot will depend again on the kind of business you are in and at what stage are you so the initial stage is these things as long as things are working out well in the family one should start concentrating on how how is the business growing i think growth is very important in any business so don't try to have structure because i am doing it because i did it at a certain stage in my life after the business had grown and it had become large and a public limited company it was being demanded by the external shareholders so a lot depends on at what stage are you with the kind of business you are in and i think that's call will will depend on each business and each family so there is again no right answer for that mm. uh many of the entrepreneurs here obviously i'm sure are keen to know um at what point do they start putting very professional the strong boards uh who are quite independent and um it's hard to attract talent when you're a smaller yeah. company what advice would you have for them so i think if you are a non non listed company it's easier than it's better to have an advisory board rather than a statutory board because there is a reluctance uh, to join statutory board this risky so it's better to have a small advisory board uh, i think the key thing is to identify what are the competencies required at the board and many times you just uh, say that okay let me have this person without realizing where he can add value the starting point is within your own business what competencies are required for example if your business is turning digital and the, all the businesses are turning digital digital input so say okay i want somebody to help me in my digital journey and uh, similarly you may have somebody on innovation or somebody on culture or or hr or finance so you need to be clear what is the role of either the statutory board of directors or a board of advisor and have a competencies for each position and then look at what are the options available so if i want somebody in capital markets okay i can look at punita i can look at xyz and then decide who is the best for me so the key thing is what are the competencies required at that uh, that advisory or statutory board and then fill them up after looking at options available most of the time most promoters look at individual and not really competence which is not the right way to go forward uh, so a lot will depend on what value addition can get from these areas where you may not be good at or the person whom you are recruiting as advisor is much better than what inter internal talent pool can do or they can act as a sounding board in terms of how the journey should be you know So, what have been the toughest things that you've had to deal with, and I mean, and what are the biggest learnings you've had from those tough things? Because I'm sure a lot of people here would like to know, uh, you know, learn from your mistakes, learn from your experiences. I think the key thing, mistake, is something which uh, you know, failures. And I have had multiple failures. And if you, if you want to, if you read my book, which is Harsh Realities, you know, it's a pun on my name. Yeah, and I great, must have covered <laughs> and yeah I must have covered at least uh, eight ten big failures in my journey and out of but the key thing was okay out of each failure there is a learning and there is saying sometimes you win and sometimes you lose and I say sometimes you win and sometimes you learn not lose I think this is the book which is uh, just got published on 30th of July it's uh, co-authored by a renowned management guru professor Ram Charan and uh, the book is in a story format and it's very light reading uh, it can appeal to any person uh, whether it's student or entrepreneur or entrepreneur spouse or a professional and there are lots of take home values at the end of each chapter uh, it's very light reading uh, it's entertaining and wherever i've given a book people have said that they've been able to finish it off in in one sitting or they <laughs> they were awake until late so my personal advice to To all the listeners would be that I am not trying to market myself. So don't misunderstand. <laughs> my whole objective in in uh, in promoting this book is to disseminate my learnings, 
to me financially it's, it's a big drain on me in terms of the book production whatever i've done but i want more and more people to get benefit out of my own journey and that's why i wrote the book all i can assure you is i can guarantee that there will be some take home learning for whoever reads this book uh, in your personal journey in your business journey uh, so so i think that's where uh, i come from no i totally agree i've read uh, your book and it's very fascinating it's very engaging uh, with really uh, you know a lot of real life examples that uh, people can uh, leverage those experiences well, there are a lot of takeaways from our discussion today but i think given that there are so many different um, sized firms uh, in the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem each one will have to carve its own path but at some point or the other as they grow they will need to professionalize more to attract talent delegate more build a professional board so i wanted to thank you so much on behalf of eo incred and uh, all the audience for taking the time to do this thank, thank you panita my pleasure to to talk to you great great session and all the best to all of you thank you, thank you. Thank you.